We're joined here at AdvisorOne.com by Greg Farrell, author of Crash of the Titans, Greed, Hubris, The Fall of Merrill Lynch, and The Near Collapse of Bank of America. I'm Ken Silber of Research Magazine. Greg, your book focuses on Merrill Lynch and Bank of America during the financial crisis of 2007 to 2009. How did a firm as well regarded as Merrill Lynch get into financial trouble? Merrill Lynch, in terms of brand name recognition, in terms of uh, appeal and respect, uh, enjoyed the kind of, uh, you know, uh, basically good opinion of American consumers that Coca-Cola did. In fact, John Thane, who eventually became CEO, did a brand study measurement that ranked Merrill Lynch as the most recognizable brand name on a par with Coca-Cola. So the idea that it had been mismanaged over the past decade to the point where in 2008 it had to be sold, that to me was a very compelling story. How did this happen? And I started by focusing on John Thane, who had been brought in to turn around Merrill Lynch and save it. But the further I got into it, the more I realized you know, the sins of the past, what had happened under Stan O'Neill could not be ignored. And the same qualities and same talents that had led Stan to make some good decisions regarding pushing Merrill forward had uh, led him to make some spectacularly bad decisions that eventually brought Merrill Lynch to its knees. Tell us about Stan O'Neill, Merrill's CEO, as the crisis developed. He didn't brook opposition very well. Uh, he didn't take, uh, there were only a few people whose word he would take and within a year or two, those guys were out. So Stan operated almost like the emperor. And for the most part, because he was in general a very sound judgment, he made good calls. But uh, after a while, if you don't have a team of people giving you feedback, a negative feedback loop, and you don't have your ears open to listen to people who challenge your, uh, your wisdom, you start believing everything you say. John Vane. O'Neill's replacement as CEO of Merrill had a reputation as a financial superman, yet he failed to save Merrill as an independent firm. Why? I think he viewed the losses that had been declared for Merrill in the fourth, third and fourth quarters of 2007 as enough, and that in 2008 things would bounce back, as they always had. He was a man with a, a very good, strong 25-year career, mostly at Goldman Sachs, and every time there'd been a downturn, um, at Goldman Sachs, they made money by, you know, getting into it while times were bad and riding the upside. So there was no reason, I think, in his mind f to think that 2008 was going to be any different. And in his defense, most people felt that way. However, he was brought in in what was a turnaround situation, a disaster emergency situation. I don't think he perceived it that way. I think he perceived it as the worst being over. And therefore, he made a series of long-term decisions, decisions hiring decisions that would take months to bear fruit when in fact Merrill needed some action immediately. Ken Lewis was the chairman and CEO of Bank of America. Evaluate his performance through all this. Ken Lewis had the uh, unenviable position of replacing a CEO, a legendary CEO. Uh, his predecessor, Hugh McCall, had built uh, Nations Bank into Bank of America, had taken a, a, an aggressive Charlotte, North Carolina bank, and through two decades of nonstop acquisitions, uh, come out on top and, and built the largest retail consumer bank in the country. And following the empire builder, Hugh McCall, Ken Lewis, who was a very good administrator and a very good operations guy, his job was to clean up the mess, if you will, and he was good at that. Um, the problem is when you become CEO and you get a touch of you know, empire building yourself, Ken started by 2004, 2005 making acquisitions on his own, Fleet Bank in Boston, uh, eventually LaSalle and Countrywide. Uh, Ken was out elephant hunting after a few years of you know, being bored by the cleanup. You write that Bank of America had an unusual management approach where the Human Resources Department wielded a great deal of power. How was that significant? Uh, in a couple of ways. First, it evolved, I think, from the two-decade acquisition spree uh, 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 brought about by Hugh McCall, the former CEO. When you buy that many banks, when you, it was almost, they weren't buying a bank a week, but essentially every month or every couple of months there was a significant acquisition of some kind. If you have an HR department running a huge business with 200, 250,000 employees, you have decisions about who should be in charge of this department or in that department being made by HR, not by the business leaders. Our audience consists of financial advisors and brokers. Some of them may be contemplating whether to work at a big firm or rather go independent. Are there any particular lessons for them in your story? And the feedback I've gotten from a number of the Merrill Lynch financial advisors who's read it is one of horror finding out what happened at headquarters uh, because they're out in the field working with clients and uh, 
uh, basically uh, trying to guide nervous investors through very turbulent markets. And what are those investors supposed to think when Merrill Lynch itself, the employer of these financial advisors, is in the newspaper headlines every day for its own financial mismanagement? Nothing is forever. And this is the sad story of Merrill Lynch. What surprised you most in researching this book? Wow the effect that enormous sums of money can have on very rational people. And in the case of Stan O'Neill in particular, I think he was driven by money. Compensation, tens of millions of dollars, uh, led to some real short-term term thinking that had not been in Merrill's past, that had not been part of the Merrill Lynch tradition. Bonuses in, in the eight-figure range could, you know, warp, distort, pervert the judgment of some very sane, rational, smart men. Greg Farrell, author of Crash of the Titans, Greed, Hubris, The Fall of Merrill Lynch, and The Near Collapse of Bank of America. Thank you very much.